Well, in four days, the Prime Minister meets with Native leaders in Ottawa, a meeting that comes after weeks of protests from blocked highways to the threat of death by starvation. So who's behind all the protests? What do they really want? And what, if anything, is Ottawa offering? We're hoping for some answers from tonight's guests. Wab Kanu is the director of the Indigenous Inclusion Program at the University of Winnipeg, and he's in Winnipeg tonight. In Calgary, Tom Flanagan, professor of political science at the University of Calgary and a former chief of staff to Prime Minister Harper. Here in Toronto, Gabrielle Scrimshaw, the president and co-founder of the Aboriginal Association of Professionals. And Keith Beardsley, a public affairs strategist and former senior advisor to both conservative and progressive conservative governments. Their thoughts in a moment, but first, some basics. Chief Teresa Spence is no stranger to national headlines or to national controversy. She's the chief of the Attawapiskat Reserve in Northern Ontario. Last winter, Attawapiskat was the focus of stories about poor housing, terrible living conditions, and even now continuing questions about accounting procedures by the Band Council. The same council led by Chief Spence. Idle No More. It's a grassroots native protest organized on the prairies. It started small. It's not that way now. With flash mobs in city centers, train blockades on the main line, and protests on Parliament Hill. You'll have to excuse me here. First Nations yeah. chiefs got to this late, but they'll now be across the table from Stephen Harper when the Friday session begins. Obviously, these are long-term challenges. So far, Ottawa has been cautious, unsure who and what exactly they're dealing with. So lots of questions. Let's get to some answers. Let's call it a kind of idle no more 101. Wob, why don't you start us on idle? What is it? Well, what it is is a grassroots protest movement. It's really about Indigenous rights and trying to revi revitalize Indigenous culture. It began in early December as a, a, a show of opposition to the omnibus budget bill, Bill C-45. But if opposition to that bill were the match, it struck a powder keg of all the other issues and tensions that are faced by the Aboriginal community poor educational outcomes, health outcomes, uh, poor living conditions and all that. And that's been a problem for some people, Keith, because that's where you get into this question of like, what exactly are they looking for? When you see Idle No More, what do you see? Well, what I'm seeing is a lot of very young, frustrated youth. The difference this time around is they have the ability to communicate. Grandparents or parents you know, prior to them didn't. Now with social media, they can reach out, they can touch you, they can touch any media outlet out there. So no matter how small the organization is or a group is, they can make waves. So this is a new phenomenon. They have that ability to reach out. And that becomes the question as well in terms of who are they. Keith talks about the youth, and we hear this a lot, that it's a young movement. Is it entirely a youth movement? There, you certainly play a large role in the Idle No More movement. I think that there's three main groups of people that people should, uh, Canadians should be aware of when thinking about the Idle No More movement. The first is the grassroots community. Now that's largely youth driven. About 50% of Aboriginal youth across Canada are under the age of 25. And through social media, um, to Keith's earlier point, we've really had this sense of empowerment to really raise our voice and start to talk about these issues and to the name, Be Idle No More. Now, the second group of people are our elected officials. Those are the chiefs. So we talk about the, uh, the Assembly of First Nations, uh, Chief Theresa Spence. On the other side of the table, we have the federal government. Now, the third, I'd say, bucket of people um, that's involved in the Idle No More movement are Indigenous communities and non-Indigenous communities across North America and right around the world. All right. So you're talking about a lot of different groups there, a lot of different people. Uh, Tom, when you look at Idle No More, who are you seeing? Well, certainly I see the same things that the other panelists uh, have seen. I would just make a couple of additional comments. There's definitely a political cast to this. One of the most prominent speakers on behalf of the movement is uh, Pam Palmater, who uh, posed uh, Sean Atlio for the position of Grand Chief. So there's a political cast to this. There are people who are not in charge but think they should be in charge uh, who, are, uh, who are leading this. 
and does also that, there's... Does that take away from what we're witnessing, you know, whether it's on the streets or in the protests of the blockades? Well, I think it makes a more realistic view of what's going on. Uh, it, it's not uh, purely spontaneous uprising, although it may include some of that, but there's also a political thrust here to challenge the, uh, the, the organizational leadership of the Assembly of First Nations. And then there's the usual leftist renter crowd getting involved in here, which muddies the waters. Uh, all kinds of environmentalists and anti-globalization activists, and, uh, you know, so the, the demands tend to become more uh, diffuse as time goes on. All right, let me bring well, up the... If the, I could just jump yeah, in there real quick, ahead, Peter. Go ahead, Yeah, um, I think, you know, to Tom's point about Pam, yes, yeah, she did run against National Chief Atlio in the last AFN election, but she came in second to him, and I think that that's indicative of the fact that she does have a lot of support uh, among many Indigenous people in the country, so we can't just dismiss what it is that she has to say. And beyond that, over the holidays, I went back to my uh, home reserve in northwestern Ontario, the Ojibwe's of Enigamink First Nation. And when I was there, sure, there were the young people talking about I don't know more, but there were also grandmas, grandmas and grandpas talking about I don't know more, having attended rallies and flash mob round dances. Now, these are people who, for most of my life, have uh, I've seen them content mainly to just spend time with their grandkids, you know, maybe do some baking, maybe go to bingo and things like that. But now they've become politically active, politically motivated. So I think if Canadians are to think about the grandparents that they know and ask themselves, what would it take to get those types of people active in the political realm? I think that suggests that there's something here more than just a, a rent a crowd or a political uh, expediency. All right, let me ask Keith something here. Gabrielle mentioned uh, Chief Theresa Spence being in the news today for reasons yep. I'm sure she wish she wasn't in the news. Okay. But is she a part of this movement or not? I think she is because she's a symbol for a lot of the people. She's a symbol of someone who's standing up to authority, standing up to the Harper government. This is what they're looking for. So in that way it is. Um, she's bringing a certain amount of pride back into individuals. And we talked about the grandparents and so on. This is something they can they can sort of soak, it, soak up. But at the same point, it's almost like she's past her due date. She was very good at the beginning. She was a rallying point for a lot of people. Now as the media turns on her, you've got to look at it and say, is she doing the, 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 the movement any good? Or now is she starting to hurt the movement by trying to portray herself, if you want, as a leader, as a symbol? Okay. Help me understand what we're witnessing today and whether or not it's really significantly any different than what we've witnessed at different times over the last decade, two decades, three decades or more. Tom, is this different what we're seeing uh, with Idle No More? Yeah, I think it is. There have been many uh, localized, very, you know, very intense, but basically localized Aboriginal uprisings uh, like at o Oka or Caledonia and m many others I could list. But, uh, and sometimes they found echoes elsewhere, but this is the first time that we've seen a, a really a spon a simultaneous national uprising all across the country. And this is made possible by, uh, by social media. So that really gives it a different flavor. It makes it look sort of like the Occupy movement of last year, which had a lot of the same characteristics. Well, and, you know, uh, uh, Walt mentions how it's crossed generations as, to, uh, as well, uh, getting, uh, you know, his, his grandparents. And Gabrielle, it, when you hear those comparisons to Occupy, um, it was dismissed by a lot of people at the time, but we still talk about it. Occupy still resonates in some manner. So is it a good comparison or not? I would say you'd really need to kind of draw, draw that line in the sand. They are two separate movements uh, completely. I don't know more. I mean, when you think about Occupy, that was about the 99%. It was a diverse group of people talking a about a diverse group of issues. Uh, with the I don't know more movement, we're seeing Indigenous people in Canada and around the world um, talk about issues about human rights and Indigenous rights in Canada. It's a more focused conversation, so I think that comparison isn't necessarily fair. I think that where you kind of run into the comparison in the future is where uh, the Occupy movement began to sort of fizzle away. And, you know, people are thinking now, you know, what's the challenge for the I Don't Know More movement? Is it going to fizzle away the way uh, Occupy did? What's the biggest misconception, Wob, uh, that uh, you think Canadians have about what they're witnessing right now? 
Well, I think one of the things that's been the most overstated in this whole discussion has been the threat of violence. Like, I think after you saw the first public protests on uh, December 10th, like the next day, you had media commentators asking, okay, so when's the next OCA going to start up? And I think that that's really been overstated because if, if you look at the events that have taken place under the Idle No More banner, um, the things that have been the most popular to date have been the flash mob round dances. Those are the things that have brought the most people out. And what those are are basically just, you know, spontaneous public displays or celebrations of Indigenous culture. And they are very, very peaceful. So I think if you look at that, you'll realize that most Indigenous people here in Canada are very reasonable. You know, they want to, they want to see action on this front, but they want to probably do it in a way that uh, is going to build allies amongst uh, their fellow Canadians rather than alienate them. All right. Let me ask you uh, what I guess in some ways is kind of the hot button question on this. Uh, this is an, it can be and has been an incredibly divisive issue through our past. Uh, if you follow Twitter, uh, you know, you see a lot of extremes here. Um, you see it all the time between the far right, the far left. They always have things to say that, uh, that seem extreme. But on this particular issue, you're seeing it beyond that. And it's raising those kind of ugly issues about racism in the country, both sides on this. Why is this such a divisive issue for Canadians? Tom. <laughs> We've only got a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, well, I think uh, something that needs to be pointed out, it's divisive because the, the leadership of Idle No More, or leadership is the wrong term, but people who claim to speak on its behalf, are, uh, are making claims which are really 180 degrees at variance from uh, position of the Canadian, historical position of the Canadian government. They want to reinterpret the nature of treaties. They claim that Canada hasn't lived up to the treaties, where I would argue that Canada, in fact, has over-fulfilled treaties, and we have the specific claims processes for to, to deal with disputes. So, I mean, this is really uh, an enormous challenge to uh, to policy, and there's... All right, so but, the, but, the but let, me get are, it, let me get back to mm -hmm. the, my point, and, and Keith, you help us here. It, you know, the, the, the issues that, that Tom is raising, you know, are legitimate, you know, differences on, on debate, but the divisive nature mm -hmm. of this issue that, that brings, a, 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 you know, a certain depth of feeling on the part of Canadians, why is it still that way? I don't think it's ever, it's ever going to go away. Um, a lot of this you mentioned it is emotion driven and people are going back to stereotypes both sides are going back to stereotypes as to how they think they've been treated or how they or how they feel they've been treated not always accurate the method of distribution of the information right now which is primarily social media twitter lends itself to emotion it doesn't lend itself to fact so again you you have driving forces out there and people react people go back to the old stereotypes you know the cowboys and indians i mean it, it's craziness but this is the way society is right now i gotta take a break but gabrielle a quick point on this the divisive nature of this you know, maybe it's the um, idealism of youth speaking here, but I think that we can and we should do better. I think the reason why people, and Canadians in particular, are so divided on this issue actually stems from a lack of education about who the Aboriginal community really is. I mean, we are an integral part of the fabric that I think makes Canada so beautiful. And if people take the time, because I believe the majority of Canadians, once they really understand who we are as Indigenous people, that they would understand and actually empathize with the uh, of the Idle No More movement. Okay, we've got to take a quick break. But when we come back, what's realistic for Friday? What can really happen with such different views about the past and the future? A week ago, former Prime Minister Joe Clark talked about danger ahead. He wasn't the first to use that word, and others have followed suit. So does danger lurk, and if so, can Friday prevent it? Joining us again, Wab Canoe, Tom Flanagan, Gabrielle Scrimshaw, and Keith Beardsley. Wab, what do you expect out of Friday? Well, first and foremost, probably a photo op. <laughs> and uh, some prepared statements. You can bet on that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, 
I think that, you know, the, 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 the positions are already pretty clearly staked out as far as what the federal government's going to say. They're going to say, listen, you know, we're, we're committed to the, to, the, to the plight of First Nations people and we're making investments that are, you know, going to accomplish what we think is the right steps forward. The Assembly of First Nations is going to come out and say, hey, we're listening to the grassroots. We're taking your, your, you know, your concerns to the seat of power. But what I'm hopeful for beyond that is that we actually see a roadmap of sorts. We see some concrete, tangible objectives saying, okay, we're going to meet again after this period of time, and here's what the federal government is going to do in the meantime, but also here's what the Assembly of First Nations is going to do on their side so that we can try and move this dialogue forward and we can actually change things on the ground for the young people in First Nations and also in the inner cities of, uh, well, predominantly Western Canada. Tom, that doesn't sound like too much to ask for, or is it? <laughs> Well, there'll probably be something like that. It's, it's been reported that the government is willing to agree to two things. One is uh, resumption of talks about education. Uh, I'm not sure that's actually going to lead to very much in the long run, but you can continue talking about it. Um, the other is uh, some kind of working group on the implementation of treaties. Uh, so, you know, a kind of an agreement to keep on talking about some important issues is probably the most that can come out of a out of a one-day meeting. Whether that will satisfy Theresa Spence and Idle no more is a good good question. Chief Spence has, you know, changed her demand several times. So uh, this, this may not uh, satisfy everybody, but I think that's about the most that can happen in a one-day meeting. All right, Keith, if there's one thing you're looking for that could signal that change is on the way. It would be some type of agreement, as Bob mentioned, with um, a timetable, and agenda, solid markers that they can go back and say we have to achieve this by a certain date that type of thing so, you know run by with a working group do you see the goodwill within the, uh, those two sides I think to make two, that happen I think the federal government and the AFN need each other so that's where your goodwill is going to come from it's not going to be because they like each other it's because they need each other to deal with the movement to deal with chief spence so i think you will get some cooperation you'll get the photo op and everything else that they were talking about but will that be enough to sort of satisfy the masses? I don't think so at this point. I think it's gone beyond that. I think this is, this is one, one step too late. Mm. Gabrielle? I also think it's really important to recognize who's actually sitting at that table. I mentioned earlier that there are essentially three different parties, the first two being the grassroots movement and the second being the elected leaders. Now, a lot of, uh, we've heard a lot of talk within the Aboriginal community that if it's just the AFN at the table, I think you won't see, you know, the hashtag, I don't know more, disappear the very next day. That's not going to happen. It's really important that we have the grassroots voice at the table, not just sort of through the AFN. And I don't, if that doesn't happen, I'm worried uh, how this will actually be perceived in the community. All right. Well, listen, I thank you all. I know we've just kind of scratched the surface on this and touched some of the big issues to try and understand where we are as this, uh, as this thing starts in some ways. As we said at the beginning of this, it's kind of idle no more 101. We thank you all, Tom in Calgary, Wob in Winnipeg, and Gabrielle and Keith here in Toronto. We'd love to hear from you on all this. You can reach us at cbcnews.ca slash the national. This is an important story, and we will keep following it. Tomorrow, more special coverage including this. There's a joyfulness in this movement. It's strategic and it's, it's serious and it's, it's multifaceted, but at the foundation, it's not coming from a place of anger. It's coming from a place of, of joy and celebration and uh, really strong connections to, to our homeland and to our cultures. Some of the profiles that Duncan McHugh will be doing for us tomorrow night.